Amen, amen. Thank you, Eli. How's everybody doing today? Yes. <laughs> ready and ready to, and willing to receive the word of God this morning. Uh, excited to be here. Those of you who don't know me, my name is Pastor David Mendoza. I'm the campus pastor here at the TFC Westico campus. Absolute pleasure to be with you guys one more time to continue the series that we started now two weeks ago on the Sermon on the Mount. Quick show of hands. How many of you guys have been to at least one of those? Two first, how many of you guys have been to two? Okay, pretty good. One, okay, pretty good. And there's a bunch of people who are new, so this is going to be fun. Uh, before we get into it, let's go ahead and give a big warm welcome to those who are joining us online as well. Can we give it up for our TFC family, along with the gentlemen of the Lopez unit catching this at a later time. God bless you guys as well. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, chapter 10 is where I'm, I mean, Matthew 5, verse 10 is where I'm going to start the reading for today's scripture, if you haven't been here, the big idea is that we're just going through the Sermon on the Mount. We're, uh, first week was kind of an overview. Last week, we started the Beatitudes and how the Lord identifies his people. Uh, if you have, want to re- revisit any one of those, you can actually revisit them online. But the big idea, and that is key for this week, is that when the Lord defines his people in the Beatitudes, he tells us that we have to be poor in spirit. He tells us that we are people who love and hunger for righteousness. So it's a, it's, it's a way to kind of tell us we empty ourselves out of this world. We empty ourselves out of our way of doing things. And when we do that, it creates a hunger for something greater. It creates a hunger for righteousness, a true righteousness of the Father. So that was last week, like I said, so you can revisit that. But I want to kind of jump off of that because I started the Beatitudes last week. I think it was about uh, a good nine verses. But I didn't give you two Beatitudes because they tie into this week's. So let's go ahead and bring it up on the screen. Matthew 5, 10 through 16, and then I'll kind of go through what the word is teaching us here. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Anybody want to get persecuted? (laughs) I didn't think so. (laughs) For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. All right, here we go. Off to a fast start today on a Sunday morning. And utter all kinds of evil against you, falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The title of today's sermon is actually uh, Integrated for Impact. Integrated for Impact. I always encourage you guys, write stuff down, have something to write with, pencil, pen, journal. You can take your phone out, but maintain discipline, like I always like to say. Don't wander into the other apps, just stay on the notes. Uh, uh, Write that down, integrated for impact. So the big idea today is that I kind of jumped into the Beatitudes, the last two Beatitudes, talk about persecution. And then it gets into salt and light. And and it kind of starts off fast, but wait, 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 the the tricky part about this is that last week I talked about how the Lord wants us to be poor in spirit, wants us to empty ourselves out so that he can pour himself in. I want you to rejoice, but I don't want you to seek after rejoicing, and that's your number one priority. I want you to seek after God. And when you, have it, you, when you empty your life of yourself and he comes into your life, then all of a sudden there's, there's joy. There's righteousness. You're looking for the things of the Lord. You want to see mercy. You want to see the peace. That's why the Bible calls us peacemakers. And I talked a little bit about this last week. But then it pivots and it says, blessed are you if you're merciful. Blessed are you if you're a poor in spirit. Blessed are you if you're a peacemaker. And then it turns and says, blessed are you if you're persecuted. It kind of went fast, and, and, and I, I made that turn on purpose because I, I wanted to tie it to this week's lesson. And just like last week, there's a dilemma. Who wants to be persecuted? Uh, many of you guys came today and said, you know what, Pastor Dave, I could use a little more persecution in my life. I want to be reviled. I want people to talk about me. That's what the scripture just said. Do you catch it? Blessed are you if people revile you, if they talk about you. Well, uh, let's see if we can break down the reason why the Bible says you're blessed. And like I said last week, the word blessed is almost like joy. It's like rejoice, like jump with joy if people are talking smack about you. <laughs> what's going on? Well, why does the Bible say that? Okay, let's get into it. Now, first things first, I want to kind of give you the, the, the scriptures again so you can have them in the forefront. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. These are the ones that talk about the persecution. Blessed are those who are persecuted for what reason? 
Okay, this is important. Not for any, not because we're jerks. Not because you know we're just difficult. Tenemos la sangre pesada. That's not what this says. I, I, people don't like me because I keep it real. That's not what it says. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, a lot of people have. Anyways, I could, I could, I could go off on a rail here. You're persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. Because of you? Whose account? Oh, they're doing it because of Jesus. They're not doing it because you're mean. They're not doing it because you keep it real. They're doing it because you love righteousness and because you follow somebody. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for they... For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So the first point is this. I always like to give you two or three points to write down and to revisit during the week. First one is simple. The kingdom of, of heaven, we talked about that a bit last week, is different from this world. No, okay. The kingdom of heaven, what the Lord wants in this world, is completely different than what this world is. Is everybody in agreement? I'm not sure if everybody's in agreement with that one yet. Uh, it has to be different. It is different. Uh, the Bible teaches us that because of the sin of Adam, it actually talks about it in Romans 5, sin came into the world and so death spread to all men. There's this idea that this world that we live in is deteriorating. This is taught in scripture, that, that the, the evil spread to all men. Ephesians actually says that we don't war against uh, just our, uh, on our strength, we don't war against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities, against the cosmos powers over this present darkness. So one of the things that we fail to understand sometimes as believers is that this world is on the decline. It's deteriorating. <laughs> Scripture says it. When sin came into the world, the world was affected, uh, and, and, and everything is kind of declining. The world itself is declining. Science tells us this too. The sun is burning out. Pollution is the thing. Despite what we might think, isn't it funny that it just kind of deteriorates and deteriorates and deteriorates? It, it, the natural state of things is to not get better and better. The natural state of this world is to get worse and worse and worse. Uh, plant a tree. If you plant a tree and you don't do what you have to do for that tree, what happens to the tree? It's, it's actually harder sometimes to keep it alive. If you don't have a green thumb like me, I can kill trees like nobody's business. <laughs> <laughs> but like it's almost hard. If you plant a tree, it takes work and effort to keep it alive and to have it prosper. If you let it just go on its own, it declines. That's the state of this world. Uh, science tells us that. The Bible tells us that. Let's not even go too far. Your body tells you that. You remember? I was just gonna sound like I'm old. I was gonna say, you remember when you were young? <laughs> you remember? Does anybody remember what it was like to be young? You're like, I want to jump this fence. Let's just jump this fence for no reason. Anybody remember that? I used to climb my house, and I would just say, I don't need to climb down my house, I'll just jump off. Why not? Bang, and I would just jump off, and I was fine. What happens if you get older and you try that? What happens? Oh, my sciatica. <laughs> oh, my knees, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Your body, and people are like, yes, I know what you're talking about. The young people are like, what are you talking about? Give it time. <laughs> Give it time. <laughs> Uh, your body deteriorates. If you, don't take, if you don't take care of your body, what happens? Naturally, it starts deteriorating. This world, and this is why it's important. I want to start with this because it's important to understand. This world, the kingdom of heaven is not like this world. It's completely different. That's important for believers to understand, and you'll see why in a minute. You'll see, I'm, I'm giving you the root of our persecution. Okay? This world is not like the kingdom of heaven. This is not what God sees. It's not what his, he wants his citizens to worry about or to be focused on. This world is on the decline. Pause real quick. I'll give you a public service announcement. Do you see, if we believe this scripturally, because it actually is in scripture, I don't have time to unpack all of it, but if we believe that this world is declining, isn't it funny that citizens of the next kingdom, of the kingdom of heaven, are focused here? If the world's declining, why is this our top priority? Come on, somebody. The car you bought would deteriorate. No matter how many homes you have, they will deteriorate. No matter how much money you have, you will spend it. It'll be gone. So as a public service announcement, if this world is deteriorating, if this world is on the decline, if the sun is burning out and the moon is getting, and the, and the earth is getting polluted and our bodies are on the decline, then why are we so focused on this? 
Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, it's, it's a, what a black way to start the service, David. <laughs> I'm just trying to set the base for why it's important that we understand because this leads to persecution. You'll see why in a minute. But no matter how we try, I always like to say, like I said, funerals, 10 out of 10 people die. <laughs> Nobody got, a few people got that. Another way of saying that is that the death rate is un- unchanged. No matter what we do, the death rate is pretty straightforward. The death rate is this, one for one. And it's black, but I, I'm trying to teach you something. The, the, this world is declining. That's why the Lord did something about it. But we need to understand that. Okay, that's first. So let's keep going. Man, what a black way to start the service, David. Okay, now the Lord spe- speaks into the believer. Okay? If there's persecution, why is there persecution? Well, let's start with saying that the kingdom of earth, of, of, of heaven, is not like this world. And now that we start to understand that, now we can hear this next part. Verse 13. You, citizens of the kingdom, are salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You, citizens of the kingdom, are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So if this word is deteriorating, and the Bible is telling us that you, how many believers in the house today do we have? Amen. Let's self-identify. Don't be, don't be shy about it. You know, like, oh, I don't know this. I want to know. It applies to you if you know Jesus, all right? If you're a believer in the house, this world is deteriorating, but you are salt and light. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, Real quick, I'll give you the point and then I'll unpack it. It means that believers are in this world to serve as preservatives and revealers. we 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 have preservation and we have revelation. That's part of what we're supposed to do. Okay, what does that mean, David? Let's slow down. Salt... Uh, in the olden days, in the days of Jesus, were not simply just to flavor food. Does anybody know what salt was used for in the days of Jesus? It's a preservative. I give you the answer. You were paying attention. <laughs> Back in those days, there was no ice box. There was no refrigerator. There was no standing freezer. So if you harvested meat of any sort, you killed an animal, you wanted to have that meat not spoil, and you wanted to use it for your family, you had to slather on that salt. So again, you just bring the meat out, the natural world declines. If you bring the meat out and you just leave it there, what's going to happen to it? Maggot city. (laughs) Right? Did you have to do anything for that? It just declined. So when Jesus says you're the salt of the earth, what he's saying is that the world declines and his plan, this is so powerful, (laughs) to slow the decline is to lather on the Christians in there. I love the light bulb moments in the room. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. You throw it on there to arrest the decline of this world. Amen. Have you ever noticed how... Uh, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me finish my thought on this other thing. I said preserver, preservation, and revelation, right? So one of them is a preserver. It's meant to keep the, the thing from declining, from deteriorating. Okay, I'll say it while I'm I'm already here. This is going to be so much fun. So if your job environment is toxic and it's on the decline and you're the only salt there, (laughs) I got to get out of here because this is toxic and my boss, do you have to get out? Interesting. (laughs) If your family is on the decline, and they're at each other's throat. None of them know Jesus, but you do. What are you supposed to be doing? (laughs) Maybe this side's a little bit more open to it. (laughs) You failed, left side, you failed. (laughs) I'm playing, I'm playing. No, I know, this is a tough word, right? Like, what what are you saying, David? Here's what I'm telling you. The environment you're in, because you're breathing, is on the decline. And the citizens of the kingdom have a, ju- a function to perform. Amen. And that function is a preservative. Right. You, you arrest it. You slow it. You don't add to it. <laughs> you don't run from it. 
You lather it in there. Isn't that funny? And I also said it was a revealer. Light. Salt and light. Salt, light reveals. Uh, when I was growing up, we grew up in some poverty and our home had a lot of cockroaches. <laughs> Just me, nobody laughed at that joke except for me. <laughs> it's all fun and games until they fly, then it's trouble. <laughs> David, where are you going with this? I couldn't know where they were until I... Okay, so you turn on the light and it reveals things. All right, so as a believer, here's what I'm trying to transmit. We're called as part of our identity and our function in this world to be preservers of rotting things and revealers of darkness. Uh, if, you've ever, if you've been a follower at all for any length of time, and, I, and, and I'm talking about like a good follower. I'm not talking about like one of those undercover Christians. You know, like, just, I'm not talking about the ones with the membership card that's all expired. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the ones who are trying to live it out. The ones who are actually trying, even if you're trying a little bit, even if you're not perfect, even if you're walking out your faith kind of in baby steps, it'll happen to you at one point or another. You'll step into an environment, whether at work or whether at family or whether at a gathering or whatever environment you're in, you'll step into it. And just because you're there, people will act differently. Anybody ever been there before? They'll be like, like, I'm a pastor, so I'm cheating. Like back in the day when they didn't know I was a pastor, but like now I forget it. When I'm a pastor, for sure people change when I walk in. But back in the day when not everybody knew I was a pastor, I would walk into a room and they'd say this, and then blank comes out the cuss word, right? And they'd be like, well, I'm sorry. Like, what are you apologizing to me for? Anybody ever experienced that before? <laughs> what are you apologizing to me for? Why are you apologizing to me? I, I don't ask that. I don't make it weird, right? I just, I just like, don't worry about it. I just kind of let it roll. Uh, sometimes you go into your job, uh, your, your workplace, and people are around the water cooler, if there still is such a thing. <laughs> uh, COVID cost us a lot, people. COVID cost us a lot. Back in the day, you used to gather around the water cooler, you'd cheese me, right? <laughs> did you hear that the boss did this? Did you hear that the boss did that? Did you hear? And if you're a decent citizen, <laughs> and you walk into that, and you're just like, I'm going to get a drink of water, y'all. And you walk in, you're like, all right, here, I'm going to serve my water. And then you get there and everybody stops talking. <laughs> One, they're talking about you. <laughs> or two, just because you're living out your faith reveals something about the environment. You don't even have to, this is the funny thing about believers. Sometimes believers think we have to force this. You think you have to force and you have to be super vocal and like almost like abrasive. You don't even have to be that vocal or abrasive. You just have to be real. <laughs> Just actually living out your faith. No, no, you don't have to like you know, proselytize and hand out flyers and do all these different things at the water cooler. You don't have to do any of those things. You just have to be living it out in a consistent way. I mean, kind of in your own way. And it's so contrary to this world that immediately it reveals your environment around you. Your yes. Gossip is revealed when you walk into a room. Amen. Sexual immorality is revealed as soon as you walk in. You're not even saying anything. <laughs> Uh, I'll say it, it should be revealed. But if the salt lost its taste, it said that, right? Let's go back. You are the salt of the earth, but if, lost, if salt has lost its taste, how does salt lose its taste? Now, I'm not talking about scientific, I'm talking about if we're salt. How do you lose your taste? You know the answer to this, right? You know how you lost it? You blend it right in. You're in it. So when you walk in, they're like, hey, come here, come here. Let's gossip because I know you gossip. <laughs> Whoa. And the Bible actually says, if salt has lost its taste, what can be done to, to get it back? It's actually useless. It's actually better to just throw on the path and let people walk all over it. That's what it says. Salt preserves. If somebody's going through something at work, you can go in there and put your hand to the wound. Oh, man, my husband left me. I'm going through this in my marriage. You don't have to have it all figured out. You can be nice because you have the hope of the world in your heart. And you can just say, what are you going through? I just said this, and you, and you put your, your hand to the wound. It's okay. It's okay. Jesus loves you. It's okay. You're arresting the deterioration. <laughs> At the same time, when you walk in, people are going to be like, we can't talk like that around them. 
We can't do that around that. And you know what happens when that happens? Here's where I'm going to bring it full circle. You know what happens when you start working, exercising this function? People start persecuting you. It wouldn't even be that much. I mean, we're, not in, the, we're in the West, so like we're not going to get the level of persecution that our brothers and sisters have in other parts of the world. Praise God. But here's what you can expect. Just because you're there, people are going to be like, oh, this guy ruins everything. <laughs> We want to talk about our boss, but man, he's standing right there. <laughs> Not the boss, you. You're just there eating your sandwich in the break room. And they're all like, ha, 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 yeah, you know, and they look at you, and you're not even participating. And you don't even open your mouth, and they revile you for it. He thinks he's better than us. Come on. He thinks he's better than us. That's why he doesn't, he, he's goody two shoes. He goes to that TFC. <laughs> yeah, fun and games, guys, until you, start, until you start realizing that can happen within families, too. Within marriages. You're just being who you're supposed to be. But because you're that, when somebody says, I'm going to do this and I'm going to steal this money so that I can, I'm going to lie to the government, you're like, you, you probably shouldn't do that. You put your salt, your hand to the wound. You probably shouldn't. I'm keeping you from deteriorating. How dare you judge me? You think you're all that? Persecution for righteousness' sake. Not because we're jerks or somehow we force this. You're just simply living a righteous way. Persecution on my account, says Jesus. All you're trying to do is live out what he wants you to live out. Does that starting to make sense? So you'll get persecution. Who do you think you are? Families will cut you off sometimes. People have experienced that. They have a certain way of living. You come into that family and you just, the Lord finds you because in his mercy he finds you and you start living that out. You start practicing some of these things. Like, I'm going to try my best. And you just, your family's like, who do you think you are? How dare you not be this that we all are? Because this world is... So, pretty straightforward principle. Do you see that? Pretty straightforward. The question is, and this is where a little soul searching wouldn't hurt, the question is, have you ever, 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 ever experienced any such thing as this for your faith? And if you haven't, why? Why? Why haven't you been persecuted? Why haven't people reviled you? Do you see now why I say, who wants to be persecuted? Everybody's like, no, why not? If you're different than everything else then you should be judged to a degree. So, why don't you want that? What's the opposite? Blending in? That's the same as salt losing its taste or the light being covered. See, when Jesus calls out to his people, listen guys, like, blessed are you of this, 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 and then he gets to this part, blessed are you, they're after you, man. Because you're just standing still and you're just being what I want you to be. So because you're being what I want, and you, that's what I mean by not having to force it. You don't have to proselytize. You don't have to take to the internet and be super opinionated. You just have to be what you're supposed to be. And your presence preserves, reveals, and by default, it'll push against people. They're going to wonder why you're like that. They're going to wonder why you don't talk. They're going to wonder why you don't tear down while everybody else tears down. They're going to wonder why you don't drink on the weekends. They're going to wonder why you're not out in the town. They're going to wonder all those things, and they're going to wonder them to the point that they might stop hanging out with you. And is that allowed? Yes, it is allowed. Is it to be expected? Yes, it's to be expected. I want to change the culture of our church to realize if that isn't happening to you, there is a reason why it's not happening to you. If you're blending in so perfectly into this world that nobody even knows you attend TFC, then we have a major problem about what Jesus expects from his citizens. Major problem. He expects salt. He expects light. You're the salt of the earth. But woe to you if you lost your flavor, man. You're the light of the world, but woe to you if you're covering it in a corner and nobody knows about it but you. He's, he's, he, he, he's getting the standard so high. It's so beautiful, man. Uh, here's what I want for you guys, and I'll move on to the last point. I want you to experience this. I want persecution for y'all. <laughs> Pastor! Yeah, I want them to just be quiet when you walk into the room. 
I want your family to realize that when you're there, you're not putting up with shenanigans, you're not talking smack. I want your weekends to look different than the weekends of everybody else in this world. Why? Because I want you to be a goody two-shoes? No, because it's the expectation of citizens <laughs> of a new kingdom. <laughs> Integrated, what did I say? For impact. That's what the, sermon, the title of the sermon, you remember? You're integrated here to blend in and to enjoy your life. You're integrated for impact. But it's not all dark, it's not all bad, easy, easy. Uh, go with me to 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12. First Peter 2, 9 through 12. I'm jumping out of the Sermon on the Mount briefly because I think it'll help. Talking about the chosen people of God, it says this, but you're not like that, TFC Wessico. You're a chosen people, you're a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Yeah? As a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of, into his wonderful, okay, there it is, and then keep on going. Once you had no identity as a people, you're like everybody else, once you were like everybody else, but that day changed when you found Jesus, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you, as temporary residents and foreigners, God, I love this. Oh, uh, guys, we're not going to stay here. This is temporary. Why are we building kingdoms as if they're going to last forever here? We're temporary residents and foreigners. This isn't even our land now. Oh man, this, I could go a million directions with this. So many people are worried about this world and their rights here that they completely neglect or not even aware of the rights of the kingdom and the standards of a citizen. Temporary residents and foreigners. I warn you. As temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. This is the emptying part that I was saying last week. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. <laughs> this, you see how this scripture just, it's, it's always been there, guys. <laughs> Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, persecution, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Amen. All right, so here, here, here's the, the dilemma of this message. So uh, you, you're tracking with me so far. The kingdom is different than this world. Agreed? Okay, the second one was pretty straightforward. We're called to be preservatives and revealers. We're called to arrest the decay. We stop it. We reveal with our presence. We reveal the nonsense around us. But then the final one is this. We actually do give flavor and hope to this world. It's not all dark. I told you it would eventually turn. <laughs> it's not all dark. But you see, like, okay, so salt is a preservative, but it, it also is flavoring. It is also season. Uh, anybody ever had meals without salt before? That's my, I, I, it's the first thing that comes out of my mouth. Hey, pasame la sal. Right? La taqueria. Why? Because the food is bland, right? And when you add salt, flavor comes out. The funny thing about this lesson, guys, is that you're sitting here saying, wait, 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 wait. Okay, so if, if I add flavor to the world, then all of a sudden our presence, going back to what I said, isn't just like a wet blanket in a, in a place. We're not just there to be like, no, 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 God, 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 hell, 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 hell. We're not going to do that. <laughs> Listen to me. <laughs> Listen to me. So many people embrace that side of it, but they don't embrace this other side of it. No, your flavor. You draw out something rich from something that doesn't look like it has anything in it. You draw out flavor from the thing that's flavorless. You bring hope to the picture. You're, you're revealers of light. Yes, you reveal the darkness, but at the same time, you point to a greater light. You see, like there's flavor and there's also hope. And when, here, the funny thing about this lesson is you're thinking, okay, wait, I thought they were going to persecute me. So which one is it? Persecution or hope? Ready? Yes. Which one is it, David? If I'm who I'm supposed to be, am I going to get persecuted? Yes. Am I going to offer them hope? Yes. Both. You, you, you give flavor. 
You draw out things. That's why I said when somebody's at work and they're, and they're talking smack and they're talking about their husband, they're talking about the, work, the, the, the environment, they're getting manhandled by their finances, they're going through all this sexual immorality and they're talking about it and when you're there, they're going to watch and say like, ugh, this guy's not participating, this guy thinks he's all that. Then all of a sudden, and it happens so often, if you've ever experienced it, you know what I'm talking about. You separate one from the crowd and the crowd, it's all like, you know, crucify him. As an individual, they're like, you know, I'm going through all of this, and you're just listening, and you're saying, yeah, sorry to hear that, man, can I pray with you? Amen. Five minutes ago, they might have been wondering why you're so weird. Five minutes later, they're crying with you in the corner. <laughs> what did you do? One, you stood out. They knew you weren't gonna participate in the same thing. They knew you had the solution even though they hated you for it. <laughs> but when the chips were down, who'd they look to? Anybody ever experienced this before? In your family and in your, your job? It's so weird, like they, they, can't, they can't stop talking about you, but then something happens, the chips are down, who do they call? Why do they do that? Because they know that you have the solution. They know that even though you've, you've, being around you makes them feel like, man, this guy's different than me and I feel so dirty and I hate them for it. <laughs> but just, but I'm, I need help. And you'll speak a, a, a word of faith, you'll speak a word of life and you'll bring flavor out of it. And you're like, you're not, you're not condemned. The Lord loves you. And all of a sudden, flavor, hope. <sighs> Light. Did you notice how, how, bring the scripture back again. Um, Matthew 5, 14. Matthew 5, 15. You're the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. Flavor and hope that the Christian can bring into an environment. Is, I want you to capture this word and then I'll, I'll share one other revelation. If you maintain your saltiness, church, if you understand your assignment of light, and you maintain your saltiness, that sounds weird, be salty. <laughs> Only the kids left at that one. <laughs> if you maintain those things, I want you to capture for an instant the beauty of that. You can change your entire environment. You can change your entire workplace. You can change your entire family. because you're the salt and you're the light. No Christian in here, listen to me, no Christian in here, and I get it, this is a tough word, no Christian can in here, can ever stand in front of the kingdom and say, you put me in an environment that was so dark I had to run from it. And you put me in an environment where like, it was so bad that I couldn't change it. No Christian in here is allowed to say that. <laughs> it's a tough word because what does that mean for you? I don't know, I'm not even going into the detail. Let the Holy Spirit work that out with you. I'm trying to draw the big picture and say, hey, no, very few of us are, can actually say, my environment is so toxic, I gotta run from it, and I gotta get away from that so I can be okay. That might apply in certain ways, and you have to take that with a grain of salt, but listen to what I'm telling you. If you're a citizen in the kingdom of heaven, you serve a function in that environment. I'm the only believer there. Then be that. Be the salt. Be the light. And the environment, I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine if we took this seriously? Listen to me. What would the city be like if we took this seriously? On assignment. Believers, citizens on assignment. We're going to work today. Oh, time. It's time. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> it's time, right? Like, I got I to I gotta, I gotta put my, 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 my game face on. I have a job to do here. I have a function to do for my king. 
as opposed to just blending in and enjoying the things that we're not even a citizen of, foreigners. What would it look like? And finally, the last thing I want to share with you is that that part what I read to you about the light. You notice what kind of light it used as an example? It said, uh, you are the light of the world. And then it said, nobody lights a lamp. Use a lamp. This is so important for you to hear. Uh, It uses lamp as our example. Does lamp create light or does it simply hold it? Is that, is that too much of a science question? <laughs> like, like if, the, if I had, I should have brought one. I'm like, I've, I've, I've slacked on my visual aids, guys. I've slacked on my visual aids. If I had a little lamp with a little oil here and it wasn't lit, and I'm like, light, would it, would it generate light from within itself? And you should have light from where? From an external source. So the lamp can only hold light. It can't generate it for itself, okay? What does that mean for us? The exact same thing. I don't tell you this so you think you can walk out of here and be the sun. (laughs) I'm gonna generate light left and right. You cannot. (laughs) Listen to me, listen to me. The, the, The light you can give is only directly tied to the light that you hold. Another way of saying that is that are you even lit? <laughs> are you even following Jesus? Has he actually taken his light of his, what, of his sacrifice and taken it to your life and lit you? If you haven't, then what are you? Then what's the point of talking about all this? <laughs> the only thing you can do is hold light. So the relationship we have with the Lord, and this is what's so powerful about this, all that persecution was on his account. All that persecution was for his righteousness sake. All the ability to preserve the rotting of this world is because of him. So here's what I'm drawing back to. Listen to me, if you're here today and you don't have a a personal relationship with Jesus and you're not following after him, friend, you have no light of your own. You can't. You'll walk into that workplace (laughs) And get manhandled. <laughs> Just manhandled. Absolutely wrecked. No, we carry the light of the gospel. And to have that, we have to walk with him. Does that make, does that make sense at all? Revealers, preservers, salt, hope. <clears throat> then they can accuse you of doing wrong, and they, but they will still see your honorable behavior. Church, uh, I'm going to pray for you, and I want to finish by saying this, that this is a call to all believers. I I had you self-identify earlier. (laughs) And let the Lord just kind of like, I mean, I I, I, I wish I could say I gave you all these practical, like, what does this mean for you? What does it mean for your job? What does it mean for your thing? Uh, Last week, like, like last week, this week, it's the same thing. I believe the Holy Spirit is directing our church into obedience, into understanding what we're really supposed to be. And what does that mean for you? When you leave this place, if you're going back to a place of utter darkness, at your job, at your, at your house, at your home with your kids, whatever, then what are you doing? What's your role? It's challenging. Uh, that's the call for believers. That's the call for citizens. That's the call for lamps in this world. This world is deteriorating, but we point to something greater. <laughs> Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> Amen. 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 Yeah, we're going to give it up. Might as well give it up good. (laughs) Uh, Take that word. Bow our heads and close to and pray together. Meditate on the word for a minute as I wrap up our time together. It's okay to, in these moments as I'm talking, maybe not focus so much on what I'm saying, but just ask the Holy Spirit, what does this actually mean for me? What does this actually mean for me? few of you who are here today that this is a, I'm not sure who I'm talking to specifically but I'll pray share this word and I'll pray with you there's somebody in here who's been asking this question why does God allow this why does God allow this to happen am 
not sure who, who this is for or who I'm thinking about, but there's somebody in here, there might be a few who have asked the Lord, why do you allow this to happen in this environment? And I feel led to, to humbly give you a response to that question. Not because I'm the Lord, but just this is what I feel in my heart. Why do you allow this to happen, Lord? Why does this happen in this environment? Why are you allowing this? Here's the, the, the response. No child, why are you allowing it? Called as chosen light, as preservers of a deteriorating world, you're positioned to stop those things. I've already given you the authority, I've given you the position, I've given you the instruction. I don't know who this is for, this is pretty strong. Do something about it. And watch God move. <laughs> Father God, thank you once again, Dad, for this time. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for our congregation, the openness that we have to receive of you. Father, I thank you that your word instructs us, your word resets us, your word restores functionality to your body. Father, forgive us if we've blended in too successfully. Forgive us, Father, if we've hidden in dark corners to not stand out. Forgive us, Father God, if we've made it more about this kingdom than the next. But today, Father God, I pray for hope to rise within our congregation, sparks to kind of start sparking in our hearts to realize it doesn't have to be this way. We can bring hope to this city. We can bring hope to our family. We can bring hope to our community. We're carriers of hope. <laughs> we have the light of life in us. We can bring hope to our community and to our surrounding areas. Father, we love you for that this morning. Now, if there's anybody here today who has never received Jesus Christ in their heart before or invited him into their life, I said a moment ago, everybody here, myself included, I'm up here, all I am in all these words is just a pale reflection of what the Lord is. I carry my light as he has given it, but I am not the light. The light of this world is Jesus Christ himself. And for that, you have to invite him into your life. So if you're here and you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, you've kept him at arm's length. You, you have a faith, but you've never actually invited the light itself into your life. If that's you, maybe at one point you did, but you've walked away, you lost your flavor, the light bulb is snuffed out, and you just feel the need to, to recommit, to return to him and, and have him be a part of your life again. If that's you, inviting him for the first time or making that recommitment, right where you are, can you slip up your hand for me so I can see you? I love that, sir. That, anybody else nice and high for me to see, sir? I see you. We're here in the back. Anybody else? Candles, candles just ready to be set aflame. Anybody else? Nice and high. Sister, I see you. Keep it up for me, sir. Thank you for that hand. I want to know who I'm praying with. Online, you can do the same right where you are. Thank you for that hand. You can put your hands down. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray a prayer with those of you who raise your hand. The Bible says that we believe in our heart and we confess with our lips. That's what leads us to salvation. The journey of faith is not necessarily an easy one, but I always like to say that the entrance is actually a lot simpler than you realize. It's an invitation. The Bible says if you believe it and you confess it, the Lord will come into your life and be your steward, be your Lord, be your Savior. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray a prayer with you. And as I pray this prayer, I want you to repeat the prayer after me using your words. You can use my words, but it'll be your voice repeating it and your heart proclaiming it. So I want to do that with you. If you raise your hand or you want to make that recommitment, the rest of our congregation, please pray along with us so that nobody pray, prays by themselves this morning. Nice and loud for the world to hear. Father God, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you that he died for me. At this moment, I ask that you come into my heart and that you save me. Wash all my sin away. Make me brand new. I receive you as my Lord and Savior in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that because of my confession, I am forgiven. You live in me and heaven is my eternal home. I am saved. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen, and amen, and amen, and amen. Church, can we give it up for the faithfulness of God this morning? Amen? He's good.